All right, good evening. Thank you um, for joining. It's an honor to have you guys with us, worshiping with us tonight. Sorry about that. We had a little technical difficulties. Um, but uh, this is a, a very special night. This is a night that is designed to be uh, intimate uh, with family and friends and, and intimate with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're going, I'm going to be talking to you just a few minutes out of the 22nd chapter of Luke, the 14th through the 23rd verses. This is what uh, we have come to know as the Last Supper, and uh, it is in the upper room, and uh, it is where we get our um, communion. In the words that I want you to understand tonight is, uh, with fervent desire, the words of Jesus Christ. So this is Monday Thursday. Um, it's also referred to um, very often as Holy Thursday. Um, it is uh, the Passover meal that was in the upper room that Jesus Christ held with his disciples. Um, just so I can help you set the scene here, Jesus is a, is a Jew, of course. He is uh, publicly known and referred to as a teacher of the Jewish laws. So someone who is very um, understanding and steep in, in Jewish tradition, in Jewish teachings, and in in their rituals. Um, it is, uh, mandi is the word, it is derived from the Latin term um, mandatum, which also means, and is translated into our common language as commandment, and it is where we get the word mandate. And uh, if, you, if you study the scriptures in the discourse that happens in the upper room, we see that this is where Jesus Christ says the words I give, a, a new commandment I give to you that you should love your brother as you love yourself and uh, as I have loved you you should love one another and then he goes on and says that they will come to know that you are my disciples by the way that you love one another okay so um, we find in the 22nd in an early part of the 22nd chapter of Luke that uh, Jesus is preparing for the, the Passover meal. He sends his disciples, um, and he says, uh, go and, and prepare the, the Passover for us that we may come together and that we may eat. And that is what, that is what we are signifying. That is what we are um, commemorating tonight, is that, that meal that happened between Jesus Christ and his disciples. Um, we refer to it as the Last Supper before he goes into his trial, into his uh, uh, persecution, all the way up through his crucifixion and resurrection. But um, at that time, it was called, it was, they were commemorating and celebrating the Passover meal. Um, it's often referred to as the cedar meal, Passover cedar meal. That's the Jewish term. And um, this is a ritualistic meal. It is very elaborate. And it is a time of teaching, but it is a very ritualistic uh, meal that is depicting the liberation of the Israelites as they were released from bondage through the power and through the glory of God, um, through the plagues and through the, the leadership of Moses and Aaron as he goes to Pharaoh and demands through the power of God that he release the uh, Israelites from slavery. And they had been in slavery, you know, close to 450 years, probably closer to 430 years, okay? So we see here that the overall theme of this is uh, um, not only the bondage of slavery, but also the liberation through the power of God and the freedom that the Israelite nation receives and enters into the exodus, into the promised holy land, all right? And uh, it is God's great power and redemption is revealed, and this is one of the most defining events for the Israelite nation. And from this event, from this event where Pharaoh releases the, he, 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 he cedes to the power of God, and he releases the Israelites from their, their slavery and their bondage, and they go on to the Exodus to inherit the promised land given through them by them through God, and uh, this is where um, they come out of bondage and they actually become an Israelite nation. So out of this story 
It is one of the most defining events that the Israelite nation stands upon. And it is so defining that this meal that they do every year, and the Bible commands that in the season you are to do this um, every year, um, that they are to, uh, they're commemorating and, and they are celebrating the release from bondage of slavery from the Egyptians. And it's all made pa possible through the power, through the redemptive power, through the almighty, almighty power of God. Okay? And it says that, uh, just to reflect, that at midnight, this is all made possible at, because of the Passover, the blood that was put on the top of the doors. And um, it says that at midnight, the Lord struck all the firstborns that did not have the blood on the door. These were the Egyptian um, families and their firstborn, even Pharaoh, all the way down to the poorest of the poor. Those who did not have the blood of the lamb on their door seal, they lost their firstborn. But if the blood was there, then the death angel passed over, passed over, and that's where we get the Passover terminology from, okay? So cedar is translated, and, this, and this, this, these little tidbits are important here. I want you to dial in on me real quick here. That cedar word is translated into home, okay? So the, the overall theme and the, and the overall feeling is of a family coming together to have a family meal in honor of the exodus and the release of the Jewish people out of bondage made possible of the power of God, okay? And it is the gathering together of family and friends. And it's a, it is a time where they are steeped in tradition and it is an actual time of learning where this story and this great tradition that they cling to and that they build their faith and their nation on is passed down from elders all the way down to the children that are at the table. And uh, that's why that song is so fitting that you guys sang tonight at the table. It's the gathering together of the family, and it's the discussion. And you have these people reading these, the, the books, and then they stop to make a point, and they have children ask questions. It's just, a, it's just a great time of learning and of fellowship, all right? And Exodus 13, 8 says, and you, should tell, you shall teach and tell your sons in that day, saying, this is done because what the Lord did for me when I came up out of Egypt. So the overall theme here is that God has released them from bondage into a redemptive freedom that can only be made possible by the power of God, all right? And it um, the actual Passover meal has several courses to it, several things included. Okay, we know that there is a bitter herb, and uh, each thing that is, that is in the meal has a significance. So the herb there is bitter, and it's, it's to remind them and teach them of the bitter of slavery, of being in bondage, and not having the freedom that every human soul just desires. And then there is a green vegetable, usually parsley, that is served, okay? And this is the uh, idea of spring or of renewal or of a promise of new life, the springtime, the, the greens that come out in the spring. And you think, well, that's a, that's a really good thing. But they dip this vegetable into the herb. And, and even though there is this idea of life and renewal in the springtime, it's actually covered in the bitterness of the slavery, and then we have the salt water, the tears, which signify the tears of the slaves as they cry out for, uh, for help and they cry out for mercy and for redemption and for freedom to God. And then there's a roasted egg, which is signifying the cycle of life that continues even in times of trials, even in times of tribulation, even in time of bondage, life continues to, to move on. All right. And then there is this paste of fruit and nuts that they have. And this is to remind them of the mortar that they used to actually build like the pyramids and all the things that the, that the um, Egyptians forced them to do as, their, as they worked in, in their role of slaves, okay? So also involved, of course, and we get to, to the three main things that I want to discuss tonight, is the unleavened bread. And this is, uh, this is bread that is meant to be made in haste as they, try, as they made it in a hurry because they were preparing to leave for the flight from Egypt into freedom because of the promise, the hope, the faith to stand on God's word that the blood over the, uh, over the door seal 
would cause Pharaoh to relinquish and give them victory, all because of the power of God. So this unleavened bread is a meal, is bread made in a hurry, okay? And it refers, in, in many times, and actually in the meal, they referred to it, the Jewish people do, as the bread of affliction, which the forefathers before them ate while they were in slavery in the land of Egypt. So as you pick up on these things, everything in the meal is designed and has a re resemblance to some kind of uh, um, negative dealing with slavery, some kind of affliction, some kind of sorrow dealing with their slavery and their bondage in Egypt. Okay, and then we move on to the wine. Okay, and uh, throughout this meal, there's technically four glasses of wine that are that are passed around, and they and you are actually required to drink the four glasses of wine, and they, the four is a number, and it is very significant because it, each glass represents a promise of redemption made by God, and it's brought out in Exodus 6. It says, therefore, say to the children of Israel, okay, I am the Lord. Here's promise number one. I will bring you out of the burden of the Egyptians. So they are promised that they will be brought out of the Egyptian slavery. I will rescue you from their bondage so they will be rescued from slavery i will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments and we know and if you know the story that he has that he has uh, um, redeemed them he has brought them from slaves into his own people and then that is the next promise i will take you as my people and i will be your god so these are the four promises that are found inside of Exodus 6, 6 through 7. And each glass of wine that is uh, required in this meal represent those four promises, okay? And if you read the scriptures, there, there, there are a couple times where Jesus takes the cup. So we know that he was going through this meal, all right, with his disciples. And then the, and then the main course, the actual meat course of the meal is lamb. All right, and, and, lamb, and the lamb doesn't actually, it is the only course in the meal that doesn't actually signify any kind of suffering due to slavery or to their bondage. In fact, it is, it is, representing, it is signifying the sacrifice where the blood was brought to put over the door seal, and then that was used as the meat in the meal, and it says, your lamb shall be without blemish in a make of the first year. Okay. So it's kind of significant that everything in the meal is resembling and recognizing some kind of sorrow, some kind of negative emotion dealing with their bondage. But the lamb is the one course that doesn't, and I know you're making the connections that I'm talking here, that it is the sacrifice. It is the sacrifice that provided the blood that actually created and actually caused the death angel to pass over. Okay. So, from this Passover meal, some of the great takeaways that, that the family is supposed to signify and, to post, and is supposed to pass down is that the Exodus actually created a new nation. It was the nation of Israel. Um, Jesus Christ, now, now these are very important parts, okay? So when we look at the Passover meal and we understand what they're celebrating and we understand that Jesus Christ is a Jew and he is actually known and referred to as a teacher of the Jewish law and we know that Jesus Christ is actually walking his disciples through this meal because he has told them, go and find this upper room and tell them that the Lord needs it and he needs to be prepared for the Passover meal in this upper room and they go and do as the Lord tells them and then when they get in there and he is walking them through this meal, like all families, Jewish families are at that time, then we know and understand what he's doing. But then if you read the Gospels and if you read the scriptures for what they really are, Jesus Christ is taking that and he's turning it upside down. And he's revolutionizing the Passover meal. And if you knew what was about to happen, if you had gone through the Passover meal like the disciples had and they, had, and they knew what was coming next, they knew what was, was significant with each course and they knew what each thing represented. And then when Jesus Christ, that night, that particular night, the night before, the night before that he is tried, the night before he is killed, the night that he is arrested, the night he is betrayed, then you understand the great significance that Jesus Christ is doing with this meal. 
and the impact that it made on those around the table. And we know as we come together each and every year and we worship with each other with, the, with what we call Maundy Thursday, we truly understand what Jesus Christ is doing. And it's our, and it's, and it's our commandment, and it's our duty as Christians to recognize what was happening that night. And that Jesus Christ is reinterpreting this meal. And he's doing it in front of people who know. And the impact was probably great. And in this meal, he takes what was generally accepted and what, what was done, and he reinterprets it in a way that now we understand how that Jesus Christ didn't do away with the law, but that he fulfilled the law. And in the course of this meal, he actually institutes the new covenant which praise God that we are living in today because now be due to the new covenant, we now have the opportunity for atonement, redemption, salvation, and eternal life through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the promises found in the new covenant. So just as those first Jews at the first Passover stood on the promise that if they put the blood over the door seal that the death angel would pass over and then they went and met every year after that, to celebrate that Passover, now Jesus Christ has taken that meal and he has reinterpreted it into his own salvation, into his own life and sacrifice, fulfilling those laws, and then at the same time taking that process and reinventing it and reinterpreting it into a way to where it fulfills that law and now it institutes a new covenant where today with the same kind of faith and the same kind of hope we can stand on the promises found in the new covenant and that in just the same way that they put the blood on the seal of the door they knew the angel the death angel would pass over we can take the blood of jesus christ that cleanses our sins and stand and know that the death angel will pass over us when it's our time to meet our maker so, how does he do that? Where does he do that? Let's look at it. We go into now into the upper room. We're now, Luke 14 through 16 says that when the hour had come, and this is where I really need you to understand, and these are the words that I kind of need you to really focus in on tonight, is that he sat down, that's Jesus Christ, he sat down with the 12 apostles, and then he says to them, and this is, reiterating the total purpose for why Jesus Christ ever came to this earth. It's one single purpose. That is that he came to die for sinners. That's it, to provide. Now, did he do miracles? Yes. Did he heal people? Yes. Did he give us great teachings? Yes. Did he love? Did he show love? Did he teach love? Yes. All those things? Yes. But his purpose, his, whole, his sole mission was to come to die for sinners. And now as we approach that, even knowing what's going to happen in the next coming hours, if not in the next coming couple of hours, he tells them that it is with fervent desire that he has desired to eat this Passover meal. Because now the time has come for everything that he was ever leading up to, the most, what we thought was the most climactic time ever was the time when the when the exodus when they entered into the exodus and the death angel passed over now we enter to the true moment that changed all of history and it is with fervent desire that he comes to this moment and it is the moment that he will eat this passover he will now enter into the new covenant and he will present himself and give up his life for crucifixion through um, sacrifice for each and every one of us, giving us eternal life and salvation. And it says here that before I suffer, and then it says I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And there is a great promise too, right there. And we know that Jesus Christ is the main course. Jesus Christ is the main reason. Jesus Christ is the whole thing. And then he is the sacrifice. He is the blood. He is the very thing that will provide for us so that the death angel passes over us at our time. And we know that he is the lamb of God. In fact, John the Baptist, seeing him, looks at him and says, behold, the lamb of God who has taken away the sin of the world. And Hebrews even says he does not need to come daily as those high priests that have ever come before him who came each and every day to the temple to provide sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice for he 
it, um, gave himself for our sins, for the people's sins, and for this, he died one time. One time, because his sacrifice is perfect. He is truly the perfect Lamb of God. Revelation says that, write these blessed words, blessed are those who are called to the marriage of the supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb. And that is the next time that Jesus Christ will sit down with us and we will have a formal marriage supper. The celebrating the church, being married to Jesus Christ forever and ever in heaven. He is the perfect Lamb of God. He is the main course. He is the one that sacrifices and provides the blood. And then we move on. It says in Luke 22, now we talk about the bread. And it says that he took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, gave it to them, and he said this, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And now going back to that issue to where he was going through this Passover meal, in the traditional Jewish Passover cedar meal, there is at no time anywhere where you say, you take the bread and say, this is my body. That was a total new concept. And what he was doing was he was telling them, I am fulfilling all the prophecies found in the Old Testament. I am fulfilling the exodus. I am fulfilling the promise. I am fulfilling the promise given to us back in Genesis 3, when it says, I will provide the seed that will crush the serpent's head. That is the promise of Jesus Christ, the promise of the Savior. And as we celebrate this Passover meal that celebrates freedom, redemption, freedom from slavery, from bondage. It's a celebration of God's almighty power. Jesus Christ, at this meal, he brings himself to it, and he says that I am the bread. My body will be broken for you. I will provide you the sacrifice. And then it moves on, and it actually says, and then he goes and says, he also took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. You may be asking yourself, well, let's, let's figure out what this new covenant, I, I'm not 100% sure what you mean by this new covenant. And at no time in the meal are those words in a traditional Passover cedar meal, are those words found. Again, Jesus Christ is reinventing the Passover meal. And, and I don't want to under uh, emphasize or not make a big enough point at the awareness that the audience would have had when he said these words because they would have known what would have happened it's like your favorite movie that line that you love in a movie if he doesn't say that line if he says another line you would say whoa 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 that's not the way that's supposed to happen and that's what's happening here is that he's taking these concepts that they knew and they knew what was next and what was going to be said. And then he changes it and inserts himself to, fulfill, to show that he is fulfilling all the way back to that very first Passover. And that he is taking the sacrificial system and then he, was, he is reinventing it. He is changing it. He is fulfilling it. And he is taking us out of that covenant and moving us into the new covenant which is made and sealed by the shed, perfect shed blood of Jesus Christ at Calvary. And that's what he's saying right there. And if you look back in Jeremiah, this is where it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their forefathers in the days that I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, out of their slavery. The very thing that we are celebrating in this Passover meal as they're sitting there. And it says, my covenant, which they broke, okay? It says, though I was a husband to them and I provided for them and I protected them, they broke this covenant. But this is a covenant, a new covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Says the Lord, I will put my law no longer on tablets of stone, but now I will put their law, my laws in their minds. And I will not write it on tablets of stone like I did at Mount Sinai, but I will write them in their hearts. 
and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor, and every man um, his brother, saying, oh, saying, know the Lord, okay? For they shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, okay? For I will forgive their iniquities and their sin, and I will remember it no more. And that is the promise made all the way back in Jeremiah's day. That is the prophecy of the coming Savior. And Jesus Christ is standing before his disciples on the very night that he's going to be arrested and sent to the jail to be harshly lied about and to be persecuted through trials. And then he will carry his own cross up the, up the hill called Golgotha, the place of the skulls, the place of death where nothing grew. And he will lay down his life. He will stretch his arms out. He will let them nail him to a cross. And he will willingly give up his life. He will willingly meet death so that he can conquer it, so that he can be placed in the tomb, so that he can arise from the dead on Resurrection Sunday. And with that comes eternal atonement, forever forgiveness of sin, and eternal life through made possible through that sacrifice. And so these gentlemen, this brotherhood, this family that has to gather together for this very special occasion to celebrate what has been celebrated for years and generations. He now has taken that meal and he has turned it upside down and now he has ushered in the new covenant. And we do this not because it is tradition. Traditions are good. Listen, traditions are good. All right. Sometimes the new ways of doing things are not always better. Traditions are good. It's good for things to be passed down from generation to generation. Okay. Don't mishear me. But in this instance, we don't do this out of duty. We don't do this out of tradition. We don't do this because it's that time of the year. We do this because we are celebrating that Jesus Christ became a man and he offered himself as the perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And he did it one time. And that one time accomplished all of that forever. And now we sit down and do this because we know that he is sitting at the right hand of God, coming with the promise to come back and take us to live with him forever. And we do this as we should do everything in life in remembrance of Jesus Christ. Because of his act, because of his desire to fervently give himself for each and every one of us. I can go back. All right, here we go. All right. As you're gathered in your families and your homes tonight, we, we are getting ready to do communion here. Um, I want you to, if, if, at home, go ahead and start getting your stuff ready for communion. And um, again, this is not something that we're doing because of tradition or out of duty. We're doing this because of what Jesus Christ did for us. And everything that we do in this life, we should do in remembrance of Jesus Christ. So real quick, let me pray with you. Dear God, we come to you now. And dear God, we just want to, dear God, we just want to come to you and just thank you, dear Lord, for your sacrifice. Thank you that your willingness to go to the cross to be in the will of God the Father was always there, never in any doubt, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we are thankful for your willingness to come in the form of man to relinquish your rights as Christ, as God, 
so that you may be able to give your life, to have your life taken from you as you gave it. And dear God, we just ask that you just allow us tonight at, to come together as a church, as families, as a united community, as a united brotherhood of believers, and that we may have a moment of intimacy with our families, a moment of intimacy with you as our Savior. And dear Lord, we may be able to, to recognize the blessings in our lives, even in such a tumultuous time as we are, that we're in currently, dear God. And we just ask that you just allow us to come together and to look at our family and to be so thankful for the many blessings that you are, have given us. Dear God, just allow us to love as Christians. Allow us to strengthen our families. But dear God, allow us to do it all in a way that is in remembrance of you so that those who come into contact with us, they will know that we are your disciples by the way that we love, by the way that we forgive, and by the way that we serve. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.